friends, and welcome to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the television show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are talking to Bob DeMont today about his love affair with American literature, John Steinbeck, and fly fishing. And all of that is the subject of his latest book, Angling Days of Fly Fisher's Journals. And Bob DeMott is the Edwin and Ruth Kennedy Distinguished Professor of English at Ohio University and is the author and editor of many books, including Steinbeck's Typewriter, Essays on His Art, Brief and Glorious Transit, Prose Poems and a Stream, American Writers on Fly Fishing. He's been a fly fisherman for more than half a century, and he's a Federation of Fly Fisher Certified Casting Instructor, and he's a life member of Trout Unlimited, and he lives in Athens, Ohio, with writer and editor Kate Fox. And we're delighted to have Bob with us here today to talk to us about this fantastic book, Angling Days. So, Bob, welcome to Chapters. Good to see you. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks for asking me. So, tell me a little bit about your, your love affair of fly fishing, when did it start? You've been doing it for a long time, and, and we learn a lot about your, your passion for it in the book, but where did you get interested in it? How did it all start for you? I, well, I grew up in Connecticut, in, in southern New England, um, and my, my family, my, uh, my folks, and um, my brother, uh, my, sorry, my mother's brother, we both, we both had uh, family camps up in southern Vermont. So between southern Connecticut and southern Vermont, I spent a lot of time back and forth in the woods and fields and streams and so on. I fished almost from the time I was about four, maybe five years old. I can remember catching my first bluegills on a cane pole with a, a you know, worm with a cousin of mine in New Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, and I didn't start fly fishing until I was about 12. So in 1956, I um, was recovering from a serious operation on my feet when I was a young youngster. And I was out of school for several months, and I took up fly tying and started to read everything I could about fly fishing. And that spring, when I was sort of sprung from from uh, into, a, into a, a more well and healthy uh, uh, situation, I caught my first trout on a fly that I had tied myself in the Saugatuck River in southern Connecticut. And that was one of those things where you're, you're, you're immediately hooked. You know, I didn't, I didn't put down my spinning rod or my bait casting rod entirely for a couple of years. I did both, but I knew that the fly fishing was something I wanted to continue with. It was enjoyable, seemed challenging somehow. And, and, uh, and it was a way to spend time outdoors, which I, which I dearly loved. I grew up doing that. Um, and uh, it was one of those things that once you, you feel hooked, you never, you, know, you never never get over it, actually. And so you stay with it. And so I've been fortunate to have, um, you know, a life where I was a teacher. I taught for 45 years at Ohio University in Athens. Um, but I always, most of the time, after a certain point, I had all my summers off. So I was able to you know, indulge my fishing quite a bit. And about 27 years ago, I think it was, I started going out to Montana every summer. And I, I spent anywhere from four to six weeks out there and have for many, many years. Um, and that was sort of a, an education in itself. Um, you know, once you get out there, you realize that uh, there's a reason Montana is so famous as a, as a uh, destination for trout fishers. There's so much blue ribbon water. You could never fish it all in a lifetime. I mean, there's that much of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the great attractions about Montana is that uh, None of the Blue Ribbon Trout Streams in Montana have been stocked since 1974. There was a groundbreaking uh, fishery study done in the early 70s that indicated that uh, left to its own devices, a healthy stream will reproduce trout naturally rather than, being, rather than having to stock them. In fact, stock trout degrade the, uh, the environmental situation that, that trout, the, norm, the wild trout found themselves in. So a lot of the reason people go to Montana is because you're fishing for wild stream-borne trout, no, never been, never seen a hatchery tank, that kind of thing. So, and besides that, it take, most trout fishing is done in beautiful places, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, the scenery is fantastic and it's wonderful. That's the thing that kind of keeps you going over and over again. It's the same thing that really got me coming over to West Virginia for in about the last 17 years, 16 years or so. I, I uh, had fished in West Virginia years and years ago on the Cranberry River back in the early 1970s. Two of my graduate students and I came over and we camped uh, on the Cranberry for a weekend and fished. And, and I just never had the chance to come back again until I think it was about 2000 or 2001. I read a little piece about 
the Elk River up in near Monterville, which I'd really never heard of. And uh, I went over there one weekend, and it turned out to be just a wonderful experience, um, beautiful water. But as soon as I got there, it reminded me a lot of southern Vermont, where I spent a lot of my youth um, in, at our camp and so on. Same kind of elevation, about 4,000 foot uh, peak, uh, mountains and so on. Um, and a certain kind of alpine quality to it. Beautiful, beautiful freestone streams, uh, terrific insect hatches, a lot of, a lot of trout. So since then, I've, I have come over um, to uh, the Elk and to the Slaty Fork of the Elk, which is one of my favorite streams on Earth. Very challenging, but it's a lot of fun. Another river that hasn't been stocked since 2004 um, by, the, by the DNR. Um, and uh, I just felt, in a lot of ways, like it was sort of like coming home. It reminded me so much of New England. And a lot of so, anyway. But so that's kind of a long, blabby story. No, <laughs> it's very, very interesting. I started, so. <laughs> very interesting. So it was always, a, it was always a, something that was part of my life, even as I, you know, went to college and went to graduate school and got a job teaching and and did all those. Uh, you know, business type things that pay the bills and <laughs> buy another fly rod or, you know, whatever. So uh. Very good. Excellent. I, I wanted to ask you about a quote that, that, that we see early on on page 54, which I think really uh, adds a lot of, of, of depth to what you were saying uh, uh, about places that you've been and about this experience of, of being in nature and fly fishing. And you say, uh, our American fascination for bigness, hugeness, enormousness, gi gi gigantism uh, is at best conflicted as a conflicted path to travel, a last bastion of hubris, because the double entendre for a size does matter cuts more ways than one. And and I think when you read this book and you, and you take us through uh, the different places and the different years, you know, we, we get a sense of that, that, that everywhere you go uh, is big and enormous in its own way, but different and, and in some ways uh, has its own characteristics that make it a special place for you. No, absolutely. And uh, But I was also thinking particularly of... Uh, uh, my love for small streams, um, which is sort of ingrained in me, because when we uh, when we started going to a little camp of ours up in it was in a town called Danby Four Corners, which literally was four corners. There was a store and a gas station, and a and that was it uh, at four, two crosses of the road. Um, and we had a stream, a little stream that rose in the mountain behind us and came down and behind our cabin and, and um, it was a little tiny brook trout stream you could step across it but it was uh, always cold and uh, you know highly aerated and so some mornings uh, get up early I could go out and catch a few little brookies and I don't I don't all my fishing now is catch and release but there were there are there times when you need to you need to cook a fish that you catch so <laughs> I would get three or four really wonderful little small brook trout and bring them in and make breakfast with them. My daughter was there and my, my, my wife at the time, they really enjoyed that. Um, but that small stream experience is one that um, really stayed with me. I mean, it's very, it's really pristine. Most case, most times you don't have anybody else to worry about, you know, finding your spot and you have it pretty much to yourself. And uh, in a lot of ways it was important to me because I have a photograph in that one chapter of my daughter with her first trout and so I took her down across the field to another little stream called Millbrook, and she caught her first trout down there. That was kind of exciting. And, and um, so small streams are just are just wonderful. And, you know, you find that one of the attractions, uh, guys, I come over to West Virginia so often, just about every other weekend in the spring to fish. And I know that a lot of people that I fish with or know or who on the, the WV Angler uh, website um, or uh, talk, talk chat station thing, uh, they they just uh, really love small streams. West Virginia has has an abundance of them, very small brook trout streams, you know, and just little blue squiggles on the map, you know, not not those big destination places, but there's something really wonderful about those secret little places that you can find on your own and spend a whole a whole day there just walking. So you know, my I, I belong to the um, the uh, Blennerhassett chapter of Trout Unlimited. Because uh, I live in Athens, so I'm, I'm closer to the Parkersburg group than I am to any in group uh, to you group in Ohio. And our our chapter uh, is was responsible a number of years ago through uh, the former president Dennis Hess of re renovating uh, uh, Red Run uh, in up in the northern part of West Virginia had had uh, suffered from mine 
acid drainage and runoff and so on, and they found a very simple way to uh, re re uh, sort of resurrect it, and it's a wonderful little brook trout stream now. But those kinds of things can be done on a small scale like that. You sure. can't always do on a on a larger, bigger, uh, uh, you know, uh, river. So, but. When your book opens up, you take us really from 1989 up until about 2015, October yep. of 20, right. 2015. But but your your first story on Grayling Creek, which was uh, July 26, 1989. Uh, tell us where Grayling Creek is and, and kind of what your experience was like in that first story that you tell us. Well, I had... Uh I had been out to Montana the, the year before very briefly, and so I, at that point I decided I would like to be able to go back and maybe spend several weeks, you know, for the first time and really try to get to know some of the famous rivers out there, the Madison and rivers in, the, in Yellowstone Park and other places like that. So I, I uh, stayed at a little um, ca uh, cabin, uh, not a motel exactly, but a little lodge, cabin lodge, and it was on Grayling Creek. Grayling Creek is just outside of West Yellowstone, just west of West Yellowstone. And it's a wonder, again, one of those wonderful little smallish trout streams. It was probably about 15 feet across, full of uh, uh, native rainbow trout. And so, not native, but uh, ra rainbow trout are all uh, invaders from another area. But uh, free, free uh, you know, sort of um, self-sustaining rainbow trout population, some brown trout thrown in and that. And... Um, it just uh, it, ju it just hit a chord with me. It was just a lovely place to stay, and I've, I've started uh, you know seriously fly fishing that summer uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, I'd done it for years since 1956, but that was the year which I s sort of said to myself, I if I'm going to pursue this, I really need to get serious about <laughs> it. So spend as much time in Montana as you can. Um, and uh, it, it, I, lo I loved it so much that in all the years I've been going out there, I really stay now within 20 miles of, of the place on Grayling Creek where I first went. I just love that area so much. And so I can get to Yellowstone Park and, and fish uh, the Lamar or Soda Butte or the, the Madison or the Gibbon. And then I can go uh, down to Idaho and fi fish the uh, Henry's Fork or the Madison in Montana, or in a couple of hours I can drive all the way over to fish the Beaverhead and the Ruby, which are two of my f absolute favorites. So, so it was a it was a, an important experience for me because it got my foot on the ground, so mm -hmm. to speak, and I began to learn the area a little bit. I also met people when I went there that first time. I I spent a lot of time looking at West Yellowstone is sort of a epicenter of. Uh, fly fishing for trout in, in Montana. There's uh, five or six fly shops and a number of lodges devoted to that. So it's a people come literally come from all over the world to go uh, f uh, be in wet West Yellowstone, either fish in the park or fish the Madison, those kinds of places. And I, I began to uh, began to meet people that I, you know, were very important to me. They gave me instruction and gave me clues about how to approach a, a river, which was larger than any I'd really ever fished before, the Madison I'm talking about in particular, and it was kind of a mystery to me. Um, but So that was sort of the starting, the start of a gradual process, a learning process that went on re really almost 30 years. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, and one of the nice techniques about your book too, Bob, is that it, it reads almost like uh, like diary entries as we go. You, you take us through, we see you in that early story kind of learning, and then uh, as you go, we learn that uh, your dog goes along with you and Kate goes along with you and, and different and different experiences there. Um, it, is that something that, that came from, from the journaling that you did as you traveled when you sat down to write the book, or, or or had you thought about maybe writing it some other way other than kind of a separate journal? No, I, had, all that I hadn't actually. I, uh, the um, journals that you mentioned go from 1989 to 2015. They're very extensive. I mean, they're thousands and thousands of pages. Um, and over the latter maybe eight or ten years, every one of my journals runs around 100 to 150 pages. I, I do it narrative style. In mm -hmm. other words, I don't just put you know, the, the day and the temperature of the water, that kind of thing, I, but I, I make a narrative each time. So I had thousands of these to pick from, and I, uh, I, I, can only, I only had room for about 40 of them. So I tried to pick uh, those that would reflect a certain kind of arc of, of progression and a sort of a narrative of learning how to become a trout, trout fisherman, fly fisherman, and so on. So I go, and some of them really go backwards as well. I mean, I, the first entry I made was in 1989, but 
there are others there where I'm going back all the way to the 1950s, kind of remembering things and so on. And that's the wonderful thing about fly fishing, I mean, or, or fishing of any kind, really. It's very contemplative in a lot of ways. You know, you're, you're on the water and all of a sudden you're, you're paying attention to what it is you're doing, maybe trying to fool a rising trout, but all of a sudden, you know, your mind kind of goes, goes back 20 years or whatever, you know, however you might want to think about that. And the river is a kind of a natural metaphor for time. You know, you, you step in it and all of a sudden it's, time goes forward and you're thinking about what did, I, what did I lose, what did I have in the past that I need to develop more. So it was, a, in some ways, it was kind of an embarrassment of riches. I mean, I had way more work, material to work with than I really needed. I ended up actually, the book, the, the original TypeScript of the book was a good deal longer. It was about 500 pages in TypeScript. And I had to get it down to 350, so I ended up, kind of shaping and cutting some things to, to give it more of that sort of essay quality mm -hmm. and, and narrative. So I like to think of them, I like to think of each of these entries as um, sort of little chapters, uh, you know, on the, on, the, on the life of a, you know, a committed but not necessarily professional fisherman. You know, I've always had this other life and that was uh, teaching and uh, writing, uh, other, other writing experiences and so on. And this was always something that was there for me uh, as a fallback, you know, when I needed uh, uh, something I could pursue, uh, but also didn't need to worry about making a living at. That was kind of a relief Absolutely. in some ways. I mean, you know. You could, uh, could really uh, enjoy it as a hobby almost. Absolutely. Yeah. I found that there was a certain freedom. Although, I, I, having said that, I, I, uh, I end up in the in angling days with talking about a couple of things. One of them was I actually went to guide school in Wyoming uh, and Montana uh, a number of years ago at the point when I thought I was going to retire from OU. Um, and I thought, well, this would be a nice way to have a second second life and maybe, you know, augment my pension, that kind of that kind of thing. And I went, I did go to uh, guide school and, and did, did quite well. I, I, I was one of the older people in the school. There were a lot of younger guys, but they, I, my instructors were all very positive and and, uh, and uh, um, generous in their comments. I ended up not retiring from OU. I ended up teaching full time for another seven years. And I thought I just never, never had any time to do any more of that. And then I taught part time. Uh, once you, know, you can retire and then still up until a certain age, you can do you know, like one semester a year, that kind of thing, which I did, and that helped a lot. But then eventually things kind of settled down. And um, l last year, I, um, uh, I was asked to do some guiding for the uh, Elk Spring uh, Lodge in Monterville, uh, just on an adjunct basis, you know. And I had several trips last fall, and then I, I picked up again this spring. So I don't do it full time because there are younger people working there that, you know, depend on that. I don't need that. So I just love being able to go over and and uh, for a weekend and guide people. And I, I, I sort of specialize. I don't. I want to give myself errors, but my, my focus is on beginners and uh, seniors, mm -hmm. uh, which I see as kind of a natural extension of my life as a teacher. I taught for 45 years, so this is something that comes naturally to me. And uh, it's fun, too. I've had a n number of occasions since last fall and then again this spring where I've had, you know, young young beginning fly fishers catch their first trout. And, I mean, it's just, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. That's what you teach for. You know, you mm -hmm. you want to pass something on to somebody else and sure. and give them uh, give them the pleasure or let them see something that's, you know, lightened, lightened your life up. So, Very anyway, good. but, so I wouldn't, I do not think of myself as a, as a pro in that way because I'm not earning my, <laughs> my my daily bread by doing that. It's just a little little thing that augments it, but it's a it's it's a lot of fun, really enjoyable. Excellent, so, very good. Yeah. Uh, in addition to to, to being a, a retired college professor and, and, and other writing and being a fly fisherman, you have a unique interest in John Steinbeck, and you have been you've done a lot of work, been editors of collections of his journal entries and all of that. What, what is it about Steinbeck that, that, that makes you interested in him, and, and how did you sort of get into focusing on him specifically as someone that you wanted to yeah, study and a, learn more that's about? That's a good question, and it's, uh, I have actually in other books written about that. I just came back from, uh, from California, from Monterey, where I, I gave some lectures on the Grapes of Wrath. A friend of mine runs a, a uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Institute every other year, and I gave some talks. It's on Steinbeck for high school teachers, and I gave some talks on Steinbeck. I, it started, again, way back. I, I was uh, the college that I went to in Massachusetts 
required a senior thesis. You had to write a senior thesis. And I, I was not a very good student. I, I, you know, went to college to play hockey, and you know, I, 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 I got serious at the at the end of my the summer after my junior year, and I thought my senior year is coming up. I better decide on, you know, I got to do something about a career. <laughs> this was back in 1964, 65. And I had a couple of younger, I wasn't a very good student, I was kind of an outcast in some ways, but I had a younger, two younger professors of American literature who kind of took me under their wing. And one of them mentioned that I, I should probably read Steinbeck, I might like that. And I, I never for, forgot it. I, on my way to hockey practice one day, I stopped, I was living off campus, I stopped at the library, at the college library, and I got a, went through the Steinbeck stacks and I got a copy of travels with Charlie which I'd never heard of and I, I sat right there and I started to read it and Steinbeck begins that book it was a non-fiction allegedly non-fiction book about a travel around the country with his dog 1962 but he started with an account of Hanu uh, Hurricane Donna which had come up across Long Island and, and uh, delayed his trip uh, I lived on the North Shore of Long Island when I grew up and it was the first time I'd ever read a book that had an event that I actually lived through. Mm -hmm. I hadn't read about it, but I'd lived through it. And I just, I was just hooked. I just was hooked. And you know, one thing led to another. I ended up going to graduate school. I actually d wrote my dissertation on Thoreau, so I didn't think Steinbeck was going to be in the picture again. But I got involved somehow. Somebody asked me to write an essay and go to a conference in in Oregon, and I agreed to go if I could go fly fishing with the with the chairman of the department, <laughs> which we did after the conference was over. Anyway, uh, I, I was hooked by, I, I, had, I had a little mantra about Steinbeck, and that is that he was never as influential as Hemingway was as a stylist. Mm -hmm. He was never the technician that Faulkner was. These are the two other major players of that period also won the Nobel Prize. But I always said, and I still to this day say, he was a better writer than he was ever given credit for. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of depths. And I think The Grapes of Wrath, which I've spent a lot of time working on, is one of the truly great novels of the 20th century. I mean, it just turns up on, on best novel lists over and over and over again. It's a, a very substantial book. So it's just one of those things where I felt a kind of connection you know, mm -hmm. to Steinbeck. I liked his uh, attitude toward things. He was also very interested in ecology uh, way before it was, uh, it was uh, considered to be uh, you know, a, a, um, a, a discipline in and of itself. Uh, he wrote a great book about, about the water, about the Sea of Cortez with a friend of his. Mm -hmm. And I also found out later as I went on, he, he wrote a couple of essays about fishing, which I just absolutely I loved. <laughs> it was terrific. So, anyway, Steinbeck has been really central in my life in a lot of ways. So I did spend a lot of time doing work on it. I directed the uh, Steinbeck Research Center at San Jose State in California for a couple of years in the mid 80s and and I could have stayed but I, I to tell you the truth I uh, they asked me to stay on permanently and I, I I just really didn't see myself living in California full time sure. so I wanted to come back and so I, I came back to OU and I'm not sorry that I did uh, so yeah. uh, I, I dug up a great quote on it that you had about Steinbeck and fishing. Uh, you, you said, uh, which I think just really wraps up everything you just said, which is, no matter how deeply and obsessively I go into fly fishing for trout, a passion of mine for 60 years, I never lose sight of John Steinbeck's comment in a lovely little essay of his called On Fishing that any man who pits his intelligence against a fish and loses has it coming. Has it coming. That's right. And we deserve uh, everything we get. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so uh, I love that. I love that quotation. It's a fun, it's enjoyable and funny. And I think I even met, I think, I think I even mentioned that in somewhere in Angling Days. Yes, I, it, I had, it is. I had put that in one of my journal entries. Yes, so which, which is which is a great <clears> quote. <throat> and and so, I, I'm yeah, a you don't want to be too. You don't want to. You know, it's a serious pursuit, but you don't want to be so serious that it's not fun anymore. Right, you know? yeah, absolutely. That's, that's deadly, I think. Absolutely, that's, and uh, and I'm so glad you like Stein Steinbeck because he, he's my favorite 20th century writer, and I've read everything. Of, a lot of people say that. I love, I, I mean, that, yeah. his his way to, to set a scene, I mean, I, I can smell... I can smell, you know, Cannery Row. I can, right. I can taste the grapes. I can, right. in Salinas right. Valley, I can feel the dust in my teeth at the, in the grapes. You know, all right. that stuff. So right. he, he's great. Uh, in our final <laughs> moments uh, with you today, Bob, if uh, someone wants to reach out to you to uh, talk to you more about some of the work you've done on John Steinbeck or to talk to you more about angling days, how can they get in contact with you? And if they want to pick up a copy of the book, uh, how can they do that and where can they get it? Uh, the book is available on Amazon. Uh, under Angling Days, um, 
all of the, if you scroll down on that page, all of the blurbs, I've got, I had 10 or 11 people give me unbelievably generous comments about the, an earlier pass of the book. Uh, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you can get me at D-E-M-O-T-T -T at Ohio.edu. That's my email address. So. I don't have a website because I'm too much of a Luddite, but <laughs> I, I, do, I do do email. Okay, <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, Bob DeMott has been our guest today here on Chapters talking about his latest book, Angling Days, A Fly Fisher's Journals, a, a fantastic book for anybody who likes fishing, likes the outdoors, and, and wants to see uh, someone's experiences with, with over uh, over the years of, from 1989 to 2015 uh, of some of the places, sights, sounds, and smells of, of, of outdoor experience. Uh, it, it's a fantastic book, and I would encourage anybody who uh, is interested in this or wants to learn more about fly fishing or just the, the whole process of being in nature to, to pick up a copy of the book because it's terrific. So congratulations to, to you Thank on you. the publication. And uh, as you keep writing and doing more, we'll have you back on Chapters to yeah. talk more about that. Thank you. I appreciate it. So Thanks thank for you inviting so much. me. Absolutely. My pleasure. And we want to take a moment to thank uh, Natalie Sheets and the staff and management of Empire Books and News for providing our on-site support and assistance today. We encourage you to come down to Empire Books and News and uh, inquire about Bob DeMott's book, Angling Days, and also some of the other books that you've seen featured here on Chapters are available for sale right here at Empire Books and News, so we encourage you to stop by and check those out. If you are on social media and you engage in social media, we'd love to hear from you with any questions, comments, or feedback you have about this chapter's program or any chapter's program you've seen on Armstrong Television. Our email address is right here at the bottom of the screen, lp4 at zoominternet.net. Please let us know your name and where you're writing from so we can keep track of that when you do send us those emails. But we do read and, re and consider and respond to all the comments that we receive, so please keep that feedback coming. We also have a YouTube page through Armstrong OneWire that's available to you if you'd like to go back and watch previous episodes of Chapters. That address is also right here at the bottom of the screen, www.youtube.com backslash Armstrong OneWire. From there, click on the Chapters tab, and we've got all of our episodes archived for you there as well. And if you're a Facebook user, we're also on Facebook. Just go to your Facebook homepage in the search bar type Chapters, and our more recent episodes are archived there that you can go back and take a look at, and also interact and discuss comments uh, with other viewers about the Chapters programs that are featured there on Facebook. So whatever your social media preference is, we've made, avail we've made it available to you and for you, for you to stay engaged and stay in contact with everything going on here on the program. We know many of you do. Uh, use those social media platforms to stay in touch, and we appreciate that so very much. So please keep doing that, and please keep your comments and feedback coming. And that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community.